Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, this is a webinar coming from San Andes 4 in Brasilia, in Brazil. Uh, if you just got one moment, we're just going to adjust the audio here. Welcome. Uh, it's a nice autumn day in Brasilia, and I've invited uh, with me today, I'm Stephen Rimmer. I'm the uh, director and head of business services for Sanam S4 in Brazil. I've got with me today uh, Lakshmi Iyer, who is our head of education based in Delhi, India, who's been visiting Brazil for the Farbike conference and has agreed to Thank you, Lakshmi, for agreeing to take part in this webinar nice after the conference. Here. Right. And on, on my left, I've got Israel Gottschalk, who is the economic advisor at the Brazilian Ministry of Education, uh, who has agreed to join us to give us some insights into the Brazilian government's uh, ambitions in the higher education sector over the next decade or so. Israel studied business economics at Queen's University in Belfast, and then went on to do an, MS, uh, an MSc in Development Economics at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. So his international credentials are impeccable. Israel, welcome. Oh, thank, yeah, thank you. Uh, well, welcome to everyone. Well, thanks for that. Uh, essentially, we're going to be getting over, over my presentation. Right? Yes, I think let's uh, yeah. ask Israel to give a presentation, yeah. a prepared presentation. And then we'll open up for questions afterwards. This is going to be very quick. I hope that doesn't take a lot of time. Uh, so I'm going to go through the presentation uh, quickly. But if there's any questions you would like to ask me, just uh, you can come back with them at the end. Uh, first of all, the, the cover, the title of our presentation today is Brazil, the Education. Um, it says opportunities and trends in higher education in Brazil. So uh, what we're going to be talking today is about the is about the the growth of education in Brazil in a couple of in, in the past uh, ten years or so, and uh, the opportunities that, are, that arise from that expansion of higher education and how the government is planning itself and it's putting it's trying to putting to try putting itself ahead of it and uh, and communicating that. Of course, in an expansion. Brazil, the education, which is the big title there, is actually the motto of our government for the next, uh, the coming four years. So, as you see, education is certainly at the center of Brazilian government policy for the next four years. Before I say anything, I'm going to say that as an economic advisor to the ministry, I'm giving you here my own view about. Uh, uh, the, the, the things that we're going to be speaking about. So this is not the official view, so I can give you a couple of uh, insights uh, very off, a little bit off the record. Plus, uh, the, the first last slide goes about the structure, and that's very important to understand before we see anything, is that tertiary education in Brazil is split between higher education, technological education, technological education being more vocational, being more, um, more market-oriented, higher education divided between private institutions, uh, public institutions in two different sites, regulated by different bodies, overseen uh, by different bodies within the Ministry of Education, technological education the same. What's important to observe here is that uh, private institutions, uh, institutions that are at the higher level, they can, be, uh, they, can, they can work either with higher education and technological education. They can offer courses in both sides. And go to the next slide there, please. So as you can see, there's my graph here shows from 2002 to 2013. In 2002, the total number of enrollments in, in Brazilian higher education, Brazilian tertiary education, it was uh, four million students in 2000.
Right. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, interwent, internet went down, one of the joys of webinars. Uh, I think we're back on air now, Israel. Yeah, so sorry could you that. carry on? Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, pretty good. So there's a huge expansion in higher education enrollment from 2002 to 2013. Actually, in the past decade, we pretty much doubled the number of enrollments in higher education. So we're going from 4 million to 7.3 million in 2013. Growth per year is around 4.5%, having around 340,000 students, new students, enrolling in higher education every year. Go to the next slide there. Right. At the center, at the center of, uh, of the public policy is the division between private and public tertiary education that we have to understand. It's important to see that. Uh, sometimes uh, public policy, let's say that in the past, that's not true for what we're doing now, is that public policy would sometimes oversee the private sector. It's impossible to do that. It cannot be done. Because 75% of the total enrollments in higher education in Brazil, they are now in the private sector. Out of the 7.3 million students in the in higher education in Brazil, 5.3 are in the private sector. We need to see the private sector, we need to talk to the private sector, we need to expand the private sector and develop policies that are strictly made for improving quality and, uh, and expansion in higher education in the private sector. What's important to say here, too, is that private uh, tertiary education institutions offer a more vocational oriented education, and publics tend to concentrate more of the research. Uh, public sector grows a little faster, but it's still a long way before we see any, any real convergence uh, between the numbers. And just to have a general idea, our private sector, the private sector of tertiary education in Brazil, just by itself, is already three times the size of the entire UK tertiary education sector. In terms of big, big players in our market here, um, we have uh, institutions have to have a manual turnover of around $1.2 billion. They're huge. And uh, such as Crops and, and Stats with the international institutions in Brazil that are, are expanding, and, uh, and uh, such as uh, uh, Lorix and be right, they're big American groups that have been uh, playing a very good role here in Brazil. And uh, it's, what we observe now in the market is a very clear uh, consolidation of the number of players, uh, players taking over uh, control of each other's and uh, very strong uh, merger and acquisitions uh, uh, movement. And uh, one I can, I can say that for everybody out there is that. What we could have last year, I am being one of these being purchased by, which is my university, being purchased by Lorix, the American group, for the sum of $330 million. Just one institution, then once. We can go to the So, thank you, Space, to, thank you, Space, to, to develop a lot of, a lot of, a lot of money involved in big markets. And at the same time, uh, the big fish is what we talked about. Big fish is they only take about one third of the market. So, there's, I mean, we see a lot of a lot of room for for consolidation for that for sure. In terms of uh, sorry, can we go to the next one? Yeah. So at the center of the public policy, you know, it's very it's, it's important for us to notice that uh, we have the national education plan. What the national education plan does is it sets uh, twenty very bold targets for all levels of uh, education in Brazil. Uh, from fundamental education, from basic education to high school education, to, to universities and uh, tertiary education institutions, there are very bold targets for each one of them. Uh, the private, the national education plan, uh, set for, for 2014 to 2024, uh, focuses on expansion of, uh, of the number of enrollments, improvement of the pipeline move for students joining at the fundamental level education, moving all the way to higher education, and especially quality issues. In terms of helping the market expand and trying to uh, direct the directions of the market, that where it, how it should work, and uh, towards what direction it should, it should, it should go. Uh, there is PS, that is student financing. We reached 556,000 contracts 
in 2013 as well. That's a huge, it's a huge number to choose to join the aggregator. And despite the budget cuts that we've seen in Brazil because of rise and all, that's, that, that remains in touch. Uh, budget is growing, it's grown last year, it's growing for this year, and we see, we see enrollments expanding at any, in any scenario. And uh, another one is Prouli, Prouli offers scholarship. We have 2013, uh, uh, 213,000 students enrolled uh, in Prouli. And uh, of course, there's Sands Without Borders. Sands Without Borders, these are a major vector of international, internationalization for uh, private and public sector students. And that's, and that's a very important policy for us. That is, two sessions between Brazilian not only students, but institutions with uh, their international partners, peers, colleagues, students, to help and move the market in Brazil towards a more international, coordinated uh, type of action. So, thank you, that's the next one. In terms of, I, I just wanted to, to, to give you that. A lot of people seem to be um, asking me about uh, what's going to happen, how it's going to be the cost of the government policy going to shift with all this budget cuts and all that. That the, the current economic turmoil that we have observed in Brazil is visibly a Cyclical economic uh, policy that is uh, led by the Department of Aspen. We say, well, that certainly didn't help, did not help a lot. But uh, it's a cyclical movement. If we see that we're coming out of, uh, of, of, of the economic turmoil. All right, we uh, have our connection problems here. Um, we have one uh, user asking you to speak a bit louder, Israel. Uh, so we'll all speak a bit louder, and I hope uh, hope everyone can hear us without any further problems. So you were just finishing your presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think most of the stuff that I wanted to cover is earlier. If there are any questions that you would like to ask, I'm, I'm more than pleased to answer them. So I, I just refer back and see you now. Thank you. 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 Thank so yes, questions please. Please use your, your the chat tool in the in the presentation software to send us your questions. Uh, we will obviously uh, feed them in as far as we can to, to Israel. Uh, but perhaps before we, we go there, uh, and before I pass I pass the ball to, to Lakshmi a little bit, it'd be interesting just to know a little bit more about uh, how many of the participants in uh, in this <laughs> webinar um, are actively engaged with Brazil. Uh, shortly appearing on your screen will be a poll question. 
and we'll leave it up for 10 seconds. Uh, so I'd be grateful if you could just give us some information. It's a simple yes or no, and then we'll give you some results after that. So this will remain on your screen for, for 10 seconds. And, uh, right, let me just get this through. Hope you've all had the chance to press your buttons. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for your participation. We will send you the results. So we'll talk about the results a little bit later. Lakshmi, <laughs> welcome. Um, you were a traveler around the world. Uh, you visit many institutions in, in your travels. Um, does the name does the name Brazil come up in your conversations with the institutions? I think um, you know the very fact that Sanam is for us here in Brazil um, is uh, the recognition of the fact that you know Brazil is suddenly on everyone's um, radar. Uh, uh, a lot of our client institutions are already actively engaged with Brazil. Um, obviously, in the last four years, um, what has helped uh, to put Brazil on the on the map uh, is the Science Without uh, Borders um, uh, scholarship scheme, uh, which has really resulted in a lot of Brazilian um, um, students uh, ending up with a lot of Western institutions um, uh, choosing to kind of do one year of their undergrad um, uh, in um, highly ranked institutions. Um, and so Brazil is very much on everyone's uh, radar. But now I see that a lot of institutions have started to think about what next? What if the scheme doesn't uh, continue? Uh, how do we um, make the best of all of these connections that we have managed to make in the last four years? How do we make sure that uh, we deepen our engagement with Brazil? So those issues are currently being discussed in a lot of international uh, mm -hmm. offices. So that is what I hear a lot mm -hmm. on my trips. Thanks. Thanks, Lakshmi. Uh, Israel, I know you're not uh, directly part of the Science Without Borders program, but can you tell us anything about uh, about the government's intentions? Are they, are they firmly uh, positive for the future of, of the a, program? It's very, it's very important for us to see that the uh, Education is in the spotlight. Yeah. So the government said it's in the spotlight, so everyone's looking at it and saying, so how are you, what are you going to do with that? So any any shifts and differences, any changes that we do in any program at the end is going to is going to have a lot of impact because media is going to be looking very close at the time. There's no there's no reason for us to think that there's any 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 way we could not uh, expand. Science Without Borders, just as well as the other programs. Science Without Borders is a, is a key uh, program for President Dilma. She sees that as a, a political champion, as something that is very important for her, and it's, 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 it turned a very positive agenda towards her. I was talking about the students from poor backgrounds, going abroad, having experiences, you know, knowing getting to know other other languages and other cultures and coming back with just very rich experiences that reaches everyone around them so it's 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 certainly if there's a direction that the government's going to is going to going to pursue is to expand the programs like science without borders right well i'm sure that will will encourage all our, our viewers and listeners uh we uh, lakshmi and i were at the Brazilian Association of Internationalization of Universities, the Farbai conference in a city called Cuiabá uh, earlier this week. And certainly the Science Without Borders program was a very central topic for the whole program. And uh, what was impressive was the number of inst international institutions present, largely because of that program, uh, the, the interest that it has, has generated. Um, so I'm sure they'll be watching uh, closely for, for further information about the next round of that program. But uh, I won't put you on the spot on that because uh, I realize that's not, not under your control. One of the things uh, we've been hearing constantly, as I'm sure most of you have, has been a very likely shift in the priorities of Science Without Borders. Uh, not a 100% shift, but uh, 
certainly a change in direction uh, to make the program more focused on postgraduate studies uh, rather than undergraduate studies. Um, so I'm going to pop up another poll question uh, and uh, ask you, uh, how do you view that shift in priorities from your institutional point of view? Do you view it uh, positively, negatively, or are you neutral about it? So again, we'll give you uh, a few seconds to respond to that, think about it and respond to that, and then uh, we'll carry on. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you've all had a chance to click the buttons uh, and I'll be coming back to you with the results of both that uh, uh, poll. Perhaps, uh, perhaps I can ask our, our technician to pop up the results of the first poll before we move on, e on any further so we can see um, how many of you are actively engaged in Brazil. Ah, right. It's 85%, uh, is it? Yeah, 85%. Uh, That's an encouraging number. So are you happy about that, is it? <laughs> okay, right. Right, thank you very much. Uh, we'll come back with the results on that other poll uh, a little bit later on. Um, please keep your questions coming. Um, I have one uh, for you, Israel. Um, this, I think, is related to the fact about uh, the, the interest that universities have in their world rankings. Um, nowadays. Um, I won't use the word obsession, but it's certainly a word that we hear a lot. What, in very general terms, how does the federal government evaluate and rank universities in Brazil? Well, this is, this is a very, it's actually a very important question. This is something that the, the Ministry of Education has been and the event is certainly uh, evaluating at the time. Uh, the system of evaluation in Brazil is still you know, a little disconnected from world ranking. What we have here is our, a, a sort of a complicated system that puts, that puts a lot of things in a, back, in a, in a basket, and uh, we certainly have to prove the transparency of that. So those measures uh, and, uh, and to maybe make, make a more, more straightforward connection between them and research, uh, research productivity and all that. The, the important thing is that the system we have is the evaluation system, all the evaluation system that is very consolidated, has been, been renewed over uh, year over year. And uh, uh, but certainly what we, what we have to think about is how to uh, create a better, a better national rankings and uh, how to control that and, and improve our the positions of our institutions in, in, the, in the world ranking, especially private ones. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, now, I'm sure uh, I know evaluation is a, is a complex topic, uh, so we won't take you too far on that. Um, let's, let's, let's move the, the conversation a little bit towards uh, the other side of the world. Um, Lakshmi, uh, you've heard, you've been listening over the last few days about Brazilian higher education policies. Um, could you compare them to what's going on in India? You know, every time I come here, it, um, it strikes me as to how similar we are in a lot of respects, uh, yet how poles apart we are, you know. And that is that dichotomy, I'm always trying to wrap my head around that. Two countries um, uh, with, a, with massive education systems trying to kind of reinvent what they are going to do so that it becomes fit for purpose for future generations. So we are at, you know, both the countries are at crossroads. So that's one similarity. Mm -hmm. Now, currently uh, in India, we have a national education policy that is on the anvil. First time in 29 years, uh, we are undergoing a, a public debate and consultation across 33 themes uh, with respect to mm -hmm. um, uh, all, all levels of education. Now, the, the thing is that, you know, for us, our biggest challenge is capacity building, yeah? Unlike Brazil, which, has, which is wanting its citizens to go out and experience world outside and come back and contribute to the economy, India, has, India I don't think, has that problem, you know? We have, on an average, um, close to 250,000 students who are self-funded who go outside of the country to get educated, yeah? 
So uh, there is that difference between the two countries. Uh, now, like Brazil, the maximum capacity is getting built in the private sector in India. So that is a similarity between the two countries. Again, like Brazil, we are grappling with the issue of how to get quality happening in the private uh, education uh, space. So, um, you know, at policy levels, there is a lot of debate going on uh, with respect to education. With both countries, I think education is at the center of a lot of activities that the government uh, is pushing forward. So, you know, it is, it's one of the pillars, key pillars for both countries. So there, there is a lot of similarity with respect to our attitude towards education. Both countries recognize the fact that uh, having an educated population with a worldview is critical to its future growth and prosperity. Yeah? But how we go about doing that, I think is going to be very interesting to watch in the next um, decade or so, um, uh, primarily because there is, it is a very emotive topic there is also, just like Brazil, we also have very uh, big issues with respect to social inclusiveness um, and making sure that the resources are kind of put towards, um, uh, you know, important kind of areas uh, uh, which will result in future uh, progress and prosperity. So there is a lot of debate with respect to education, that yes. much I can say. Thanks very much. Uh, first of all, uh, we have a number of comments that are saying, find it hard to, to hear us, so can we all speak up nice and clearly, please? Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry, uh, sorry, everybody. We uh, get a few technical problems. I hope you're hearing us better now. I'm certainly, tell me if I'm shouting. Um, perhaps uh, we could uh, move on to uh, a question that I think uh, is particularly interesting to our international institutions is, is the question of English language, uh, which is often a barrier to uh, often a barrier to to entry for Brazilian students into institutions. Has the federal government uh, got any has tackled this issue of, of English language skills in at, particularly at the higher higher education level? Yeah, I see. We definitely see that as a, a barrier. I have to say that I'm not an expert in that area. I don't. I don't actually work um, with uh, with uh, with that uh, with that issue. Uh, I can give you more more of a general idea what uh, what's what's our what's our understanding of that. Certainly, we've been we've been in contact with they're, they're, they're major uh, uh, international organi organizations coming after the ministry, coming to us, and to, they want to discuss that. They want to understand how can they be part of that how can they how can they play a role so that's is that to, to help the ministry help the the higher education tertiary education institutions in providing the right uh, skill set to the to the to the students and certainly that is it is a concern for us um, and uh, what we've been doing is we're, we're trying to uh, we'll partner up and uh, Get uh, get uh, other institutions to help us to give uh, give international give uh, English training, especially international languages training in uh, in our tertiary education institutions. That's for sure. Right. Thank you. I mean, certainly, um, I think there are encouraging signs that uh, English language skills are developing rapidly um, as families and students recognise they they're vital uh, that they are absolutely vital for professional absolutely. development. Um, so we are, I'm hopeful, hopefully in a few years' time, this will no longer be an issue for international institutions, and they will be uh, impressed by the English language skills of their Brazilian entrants. Um, let me uh, bring up a question that uh, has come up from one of our, our listeners. Um, what do kind of opportunities might there be you know, for in-country um, Technical institution partnerships, as opposed to so the the, the second layer of uh, education of the more technical vocational education. It's very important that uh, see that the for international partnerships are quite easy to establish with so because they do not depend on the government. It's very easy. You don't have to go through the government to make uh, to establish uh, connections partnerships. Agreements with uh, with institutions at any level. I mean, it's uh, I'm talking about public. I'm talking about, about private. 
public institutions have, if, you, if, you're, if you're talking about uh, uh, public uh, uh, technical uh, institutions, we have to remember that because they they have a public budget, they're part of the, the public budget, they can commit budget to certain things in which the, on the private sector they could, they can do that, they have more flexibility, they can establish partnerships and put money and send students and do it um, as they please. It's, it's, it's much easier to establish, uh, to establish this kind of agreements with, with private institutions. Public institutions can, can do that, but they cannot commit uh, budget-wise to that. So that's, uh, but important to say is that if, if international institutions, they want to partner up with local with Brazilian institutions here in Brazil, uh, all, they, all they have to do is pick up the phone and ring them. <laughs> right, <what> <laughs> okay. So will they get somebody who replies in, in English to them? No, I'm sure they will by now. Um, certainly um, the feedback we had from the Far by conference is that institutions are eager to establish uh, appropriate relationships external with external institutions and as you say pick up the phone send that email and, and we will get there um lakshmi uh what is can you say something about the the uh learning points that you might have for the brazilian government from what you your what you have seen in terms of um higher education um, expansion in India and indeed elsewhere in your travels. Um, what has worked? How how successful has have expansion efforts been in getting that essential third uh, tertiary education to to a great proportion of the population? I think uh, increasingly there is realization around the world that the the kind of expectations that the future generations have of higher education mm -hmm. per se public institutions are probably not in a position to kind of you know fulfill those in terms of whether it be in the form of investment mm -hmm. that is required um, or expansion of capacity yeah and uh, so i can very comfortably talk about uh, what we are seeing in india where the massive expansion that is happening is happening in the private space um, uh, because uh, only the private sector probably can kind of, you know, take the decisions at, you know, at a, at a fast pace to be able to keep up with the demand. Even at that, you know, India's demand in the next um, two to three decades, uh, even if we were to open a university every, every day, uh, we are probably not going to fulfill those because we are trying to push our en gross enrollment ratio up from 18 to 30 percent. Mm. But um, in terms of, you know, a key learning is that governments worldwide and citizens will have to reorient the way they look at uh, private sector because private sector institutions probably worldwide are treated as children of a lesser god, uh, whereas uh, they are probably kind of, you know, stepping in to uh, bridge the gap uh, that is, you know, uh, widening uh, between the requirements of the market and what you need to do to address um, uh, those demands. So um, I think one of the key learnings for um, governments worldwide would be to kind of ensure that uh, private sector is given all sorts of support and help to uh, enable uh, their participation, active participation with caveats, of course, around quality and uh, delivery of a promise that they uh, make to the students that they recruit. Right. Do you agree? Well, it's amazing to see how much, uh, how much, uh, how much India and Brazil have uh, challenges alike. It's, 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 it's great. And uh, more importantly, actually, I understand that we, we have to clearly work together, Brazil, India, and certainly uh, my I see a lot of a lot of a lot of opportunities and a lot of uh, a lot of space for international cooperation that can really help develop this the the, the Brazilian and the Indian sector, of course, the education sector, of course. And I see how we can we can do that between ourselves, between India and between Brazil. How we can look at each other, benchmark uh, our policies against each other, and check how we're going. But I can imagine that's it would be a very interesting thing to, for, for, to ask you actually. How can 
international institutions abroad, away from India and from Brazil, help and and help to come to Brazil and to and to to India, of course, to uh, resolve quality issues and to help us improve in quality standards. I think one of the uh, one of the critical challenges in internationalization that you see uh, in education space per se is how you perceive quality. Yeah. Because different countries have different standards when it comes to what they consider as a quality education. Um, when you go to a, a, a top institution per se in, in, in countries like the US, UK, there are certain um, expectations that you have that are continuously met, whether it be in the form of infrastructure, whether it's in the quali qualifications of the uh, key academics and so on and so forth. But when you um, look at populous countries like India, uh, where you probably need more teaching institutions than research institutions, because you are trying to kind of churn out um, uh, graduates with varying levels of qualifications. You need people with um, uh, technical abilities. One of the key lessons that countries like India can take from um, uh, countries like, say, the United States, um, UK, Australia, is about how they have got a very well evolved system of further education and skills um, education providers. Because, for example, in India, um, skilled education is considered a notch below uh, 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 you know, people with a graduate uh, degree. Uh, whereas, we really need people with um, uh, those kind of abilities. Um, uh, to ensure that our uh, factories are working to full potential, uh, we we need people with you know um, drawing technical uh, drawing ability more than engineers per se. But we are actually kind of you know there is a mismatch in what we are producing in our education system and what our industry actually needs. And in the last decade or so, our government has I mean there is a recognition that this is happening which is great because the first thing to fix a problem, I believe, is accepting that you you have a problem, which we have. Lot of talk has happened. Lot of uh, government bodies have been created to try and see if we can kind of, you know, take lessons out of what's gone on in other parts of the world to ensure that we develop a framework which enables people with graduate degrees to migrate to say vocational skills and vice versa because that mobility of qualifications is something that countries like india and brazil can um, really look up to uh, and learn from other countries which have been very successful in this the classic case being germany where you know skilled um, uh, technicians um, are considered probably at the same level or above people with uh, an average degree Thanks, I think, and that's a good, a good point in that, um, yeah, we, we talk about higher education as a very general, general topic, but technical education as such um, is a vital part of the development of a country. Um, what is the view of the federal government on technical education? What, what, how does it stand in terms of, of resourcing it in encouraging technical education development? Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's a very good it's a very it's a very good point. It, it, I I it's 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 actually even it's very interesting that everything uh, you're saying about India, I could I could be repeating the same things about Brazil. So it's good that you learn two countries at once. <laughs> you just get the whole package just like that. Uh, uh, in Brazil, we have a program called Pronatec that is another national political champion of, of our government, uh, trying to expand vertically the the number of students in, in, in technological courses, tech, in technical courses. And uh, what we could see, and that's something that we've been doing, actually, it's, it's very recent, is looking at how other, all the policies, all the expansion programs, they work together. And we have seen that sometimes they overlap each other, and we're looking at that now. That's why there's a there's a there's a slight shift now 
that we can observe in VS because VS is the student finance for people going to to higher education. And that was we could see that we we were actually coming too strong. We were attracting too many students into higher education as a as a government policy. And, and on the other hand, we were taking students out of Pronatec, which is which is a scholarship to pay for for, for students to study at uh, technical institutions. So sometimes we have to look at how all the policies uh, map together and cluster together, how they fit together to make sure that uh, we're actually getting we're getting the right results out of it. So yes, Pernatec is a big program for us. It's a big it's a big challenge for us to to improve in terms of of, of skills, and uh, and certainly uh, I think that for if you're going to see you're going to see that we're going to try to make them the the political or, or government policy uh, ever more consistent with each other and specific about certain things. One thing that I must admit that I'm very jealous about is that you know the more I listen to you, Israel, I feel that uh, Brazil is probably a lot more deliberate about where it wants to kind of move um, in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, with India, because we are in the process of now doing this national education policy, the, the clarity of which we will only get towards the end of the year. Right now, I sometimes feel that you know we are in a sort of you know in a state of limbo, not knowing what is going to happen um, uh, because you know a lot of our um, uh, clients and also um, uh, you know uh, uh, senior people that I meet in the education space, they all want to know when India will open up to foreign education providers. Yeah, at least you know when I look at the the private education providers expansion in Brazil. I see a lot of uh, foreign players um, who are now kind of uh, catering to over 80% of your, uh, uh, you know, college-going uh, audience. Whereas in India, uh, it is still a very distant kind of, uh, you know, a phenomenon. I feel uh, in terms of what is going to happen with the foreign education providers, uh, how they will uh, they will be enabled to come inside because there is definitely a demand which we in uh, we are not in a position to currently meet and we would need all the help that we can get to uh, educate um, um, uh, our uh, you know our youngsters but for that we will also need to offer a framework that gives clarity for foreign providers to be able to operate efficiently and also uh, in a way that makes it viable for them to operate within the country so on that aspect, I'm very jealous about what <laughs> Brazil has managed to uh, achieve in the last uh, few we, years. It's, it's for thank sure you. that we, in many ways, but I, that's, yeah, that's a big thank you there. Yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um, we, in terms of government, in terms of government policy, I, I see that the government clearly knows where, it, what's needed, where do we want to go. That's why we have the national education plan. It's a strategic plan. It sets targets for mm -hmm. specific targets and, and and targets for every area. And very it's very detailed. And it's very important for us to do that. If we don't get every one of the targets accomplished by 2024, we know where we're going. Mm -hmm. At least we know what's the direction. We know this is this is how we should we should think our public policy in terms of education. This is what we want to do. This is very important. And all the time, this is very important that the the national education plan sets targets horizontally okay. for every for every aspect of uh, of education for primary education for ba for uh, high school education for higher education but it also sets targets and that's very important sets targets uh, for for I mean vertically for every area in terms of in terms of teaching in terms of innovation in terms of uh, Qualifications for for students in every area for sorry for for teachers and for professors and for lecturers in terms of research, it's 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 very nice. Sometimes you won't agree with everything that the national education plan says, but there it is. See, that is what I'm saying. At least you have a plan. Well, I am hoping that you know we will have a plan at the end of the year. Uh, I, I live in hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's right. I'm sure somebody's listening out there, so noting that down. Um, I've got questions coming in now, so perhaps we've had an um, interesting couple of questions coming up here. Um, there is a, <clears throat> a view that uh, these returning Science Without Borders uh, students 
are experiencing different teaching and learning uh, mechanisms in, in the in the institutions in which they're being hosted. Um, we heard about this at Faubai. Uh, innovative techniques in, in, in learning. Um, how does the, the federal government go about encouraging the institutions it funds and, and, and guides at, at an overall level to innovate in teaching and learning? Well, again, that's, I, as an economist, that wouldn't be my very yeah, okay, expertise. I appreciate that. Okay. <laughs> But of course, we can talk. We can, in general terms, of course. Then, what well, we're sitting in a, a very an institution here. This is YASB. We're sitting here at this. It's it's a beautiful. It's a beautiful uh, uh, university here in Brazil, and it's got all the technologies that you can see anywhere else in the world. Sometimes you won't see that in every one of the institutions because there are small institutions in the countryside. You won't see. You won't see the same technology you can see in the big cities, of course. But then, of course. That the the our our idea of expansion now for the higher education sector is certainly to go stronger onwards to the interior, go towards smaller cities, try to catch those people that never had a chance to go into higher education. Now they will have that chance. Sometimes using uh, uh, um, long distance learning, distance learning, what you call it. Uh, so yes, uh, in terms of infrastructure. We see an improvement in terms of the market is getting stronger, consolidated, more professional, more resourceful, using different technologies, uh, and certainly uh, expanding in a way that uh, that we want to look into their quality and make sure that they're they're following up with their with their with their quality standards, of course. Great, thank you very much. No, that's encouraging. Here's a question for you, which is perhaps a little bit more in, uh, down the road of an economist. Um, uh, one of our, our viewers is concerned about uh, financial. What is hearing about finances uh, in federal government and in, indeed generally that Brazil is going through a somewhat tough phase this year in terms of public finance? Um, how can you can you give us some idea about how deep an impact this is having on Federal universities' ability to to operate internationally, in particularly, and to what extent individual states, such as São Paulo, Minas Gerais, and indeed other states, are uh, are able to take up some of that load of sustaining foreign partnerships. Let's just give an overview of how the financial woes that that are are clearly there um, are impacting on federal institutions. Yeah, we have to remember. This is this is a very important question. I think I I I can see I can see I can see what's the concern there. Uh, it's important to remember that uh, in terms of higher education, especially, it's, it's around 90, 80, 87, 88 percent of the of the of the higher education in Brazil is regulated directly by the federal government and policies. The policies that uh, that um, uh, lead that section of the, the, of, the of, of the of the education, the higher education is are are guided by uh, higher education uh, by by federal government. So it's important to, to remember that only 10% of of institutions in Brazil are actually direct directly regulated by their by their uh, state governments. So when you want to partner with someone in Brazil, you shouldn't worry too much about uh, the state uh, about the, the, the state finances, because most of the the, the 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 state universities they tend to be very big, very consolidated, huge quality, uh, uh, huge quality uh, uh, leaps year by year and uh, expansion and all that. And in terms of all the rest of them, they're not uh, the, the private ones. When you're talking about private institutions, you're talking about federal institutions. Their budgets and their the programs that uh, that lead them are directly affiliated to the to the federal government. So the, the policy comes straight up from there. So I wouldn't I, I don't I don't see I don't see why I should we should, people should worry about 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 uh, specific state finances and the capability of certain institutions in coping with international projects and all that because they are in geographical places. Important is to understand how are they positioned strategically with the national education plan, how they're positioned with respect to the national policies, are they are they well qualified? Do they have good quality standards? 
and that's that's pretty much it. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, I'll take this opportunity to to plug a, a further webinar we will be doing in early June, which uh, I think addresses uh, topics of interest uh, in regarding finance, which is how uh, research is funded in Brazil. Uh, how the importance of the of the states in, in in research and indeed federal governments and how uh, often uh, there's ring fence funding which has perhaps uh, uh, there's less severe impact of economic downturns on that funding. So with that little um, little enticement, uh, you'll be hearing from us soon about that that forthcoming webinar. Uh, before we go any further, let's see the, the poll results for, for the second poll. Um, how do you view the Science Without Borders, the possibility of it becoming more postgraduate oriented? Let's have a look. So we have uh, positively 25%, negatively not many, 5%, and neutral 25%, is that right? Yeah. Um, so fairly even split between positively uh, and neutral. So uh, that's, uh, that's interestingly that the, there certainly are positive viewpoints there. Um, the negative viewpoint is, is low, which is encouraging, I think. So however, whatever direction the, the program takes, I'm sure you, will, you can look forward to support from uh, the institutions that are going to be hosting the Science with Water students. We're, we're coming to the end of our, our uh, webinar so if you have any urgent question that's burning in your mind at the moment please send it to us <clears throat> and we'll try and fit it in over the next couple of minutes um, you mentioned in your about resourcing of, uh, of institutions about how private institutions such as um, as our host ISP um, is um, as a private institution perhaps has more access to some technological resources than the uh, the uh, state sector um, how uh, far does the federal government go in trying to establish private public partnerships in terms of building new facilities such as research facilities I know you've got the new synchrotron facility in Campinas you've got uh, but how far is it possible for the federal government to, to actually bring in industry and, and um, other resources into um, giving universities the opportunity to develop their facilities to world-class standards? Well, in, in, well, of course, the, the, it's a very important question. And uh, what we see is, in terms of the federal university special, the public institutions federal institutions especially that uh, are, are national research champions that's, that's that I could say that could put that like that uh, it it's pretty much up to the to the institution to decide what they want to do they have they have the freedom to decide what they're going to do it's a the budget that is passed to that there's certain strings but the internal distribution of the budget within the universities is something that is up to them how they're going to establish their partnerships what what are their the the areas that they want to develop the most what sort of facilities they want to improve it's up to them the federal government doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't go into every one of the universities to tell them what they, what you know how they should manage their own uh, their own budgets which is something good i mean in terms of partnerships uh, when you set up a partnership with a with a with a federal institution in Brazil, uh, if the program, if the, the proposal is promising, there's no problem for the institution to say, well, we could definitely uh, shift a little bit, little bit of our resources into that because that's because that's something mm -hmm. promising, and that's perfectly uh, fine with the government and perfectly it's up I to think the that, institution. That's a, that's a, uh, there's a there is a lot of difference in how we approach um, partnerships and collaborations in the government-funded institutions in India um, to what you are saying, Israel. Because right now, as, as I speak, we are trying to figure out, the government is trying to figure out how to um, uh, make sure that all of the collaborations, uh, agreements that the uh, local institutions are entering into with foreign institutions, how they can be regulated. 
you know i personally think that you know the the government should be in the business of putting a framework in and so long as everybody is operating within that framework the institutions should be given sufficient freedom to decide how they want to uh, operate within that so um, hopefully by the end of the year we will have a bit more clarity on how we approach even our collaborations with mm -hmm. foreign institutions but it's very interesting to hear what israel is saying in terms of you know how the brazilian uh, government looks at you know how people use their funds once they have been uh, allocated yeah okay thanks very much lakshmi um we're drawing to a close uh Thank you very much for being patient with us in the initial phases, but uh, we uh, will be treating the audio and uh, making available, I hope, a, a recorded version of this webinar. Um, we will also, at the same time, I'm glad to say, be able to put on our website a podcast we've uh, recorded earlier today with uh, the president of, the, of our host institution, the IESB, with uh, Dr. Eda Machado, who gave us a uh, fascinating insight into the role of private sector institutions in Brazil, which is um, which are account for 75% of the student uh, intake in Brazil, and um, whose voice is very interesting to hear. So you'll be shortly seeing that on our on our website. Um, so I think uh, close bringing this to a close. Um, we have various questions which we will look at, and we hope in future uh, webinars to be able to address some of the questions which uh, are coming in now uh, on other topics. Uh, we have put you a little bit on the spot, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but you cope very well. So thanks very much. You, I realize the position of, of somebody working in, in a public ministry can be complicated in terms of, of policy. And uh, thanks very much for fielding those questions and giving us that insight. And Lakshmi, thank you so much for, for your insights into the comparison with, with India in this respect. Uh, there's clearly space for India and Brazil to communicate more strongly, and I know there are strong initiatives by the BRIC government, shall we say, at the higher education level to talk more closely. I believe there is a, a major seminar coming up in, in Russia later this year, which will give an, a, a forum for, for the institutions to discover how, uh, to discuss how they can collaborate more and more closely, I think, which will be an interesting site. So I think, uh, let me just finish by, again, thanking our host institution, ISB, uh, its president, uh, Dr. Eda Machado, and um, my, my, uh, my friend and colleague, Christina Dale, who organized all this here, uh, for all your support. And I hope very much we'll be able to meet you again in a webinar coming up soon. Thank you very, very much. Good night.